The character and atmosphere of Scotland, located in the north part of the British Isles, can't be mistaken. Emerald green fields, lilac-tinged hills, shining lakes, historical castles, men in tartan kilts, bagpipe music, and golden whiskey. Edinburgh has been the capital of Scotland since 1999 again, and with around half a million population, it's the second most populous city of the country. The Scottish Parliament is in session here. Edinburgh is the center of education and scientific life, and it's the second most important center of finance after London. Its museums, theaters, concert and exhibition halls make the city a cultural center. On the side of Princess Street towards the valley, the first flower clock of the world was made in 1903. It consists of about 24,000 flowers. Scotland is proud of its poets and writers, and the country is abundant in memorial places commemorating them. In Lady Stair's house dating back to 1622, Scott, Burns, and Stevenson are remembered in an exhibition. Scotland has given not only literary men to the world, but also several scientists, such as Alexander Fleming, the inventor of penicillin, Lord Calvin, James Watt, who developed the steam engine, and Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone. Sir Walter Scott was the greatest master of the genre of the historical novel. The monument in Princess Street was made soon after his death. George Michael Kemp's work in Gothic style is 61 meters high and 287 stairs lead up to its top, which is at the same time a lookout tower. The Ryder statue was made by Sir John Steele. The region of Princess and Rose Street is one of the ten busiest centers of retail trade in the whole of Great Britain. Its best-known department store, Jenner's, is also called Herod's of the North. Of the sites, the building of the Old Parliament, St. Giles Cathedral, and Gladstone's Land deserve being mentioned. Gladstone's Land is the home of a rich merchantman from the 17th century, which has remained in its original form. In its neighborhood, the Scottish Whiskey Heritage Center can be found, and we can also see the Outlook Tower, from the terrace of which there's a beautiful view over the city, complete with bagpipe music. In Edinburgh, over 700 pubs can be found, most of them in Rose Street, which locals call the Street of the Pubs. In the pubs, not only drinks, but also food is served. We can try a cock leaky soup, which is made from chicken, leek, and rice, haggis, which is stuffed with innards and is similar to a sausage, Aberdeen Angus steak, and butterscotch tart with caramel as dessert. And they can be washed down with strong local beer. Castle Rock, from where we can see the valley of the River Forth, has been the residence of Scottish kings since the 10th century. Calton Hill is a hill rising 100 meters above the city and can be seen well from almost any point of the city. The 33-meter high tower was built in honor of Admiral Nelson. There's an unfinished monument on the hill in Athenian Parthenon style, as well as an old royal observatory. Royal Mile is the center of the Old Town. Princess Street, which is parallel to it, separates the Old Town from the New Town. In the deep valley between them, a river flows. The railway is also here, and the main railway station, Waverley, as well. We can get a picture of the geography and history of the city at the Royal Museum of Scotland. Bobby, the Sky Terrier, wouldn't move away from his owner's grave. For 14 years, Bobby went to have lunch at Greyfriars Pub, but when he heard the gunshot at one, he returned to guard his master's grave. After his death, he was buried next to his owner, and a statue was made in his memory. The most important cultural event of Edinburgh is the festival, held every August, and the military tattoo following it, which is a military parade. Besides this, a book and film festival are also held at that time, as well as Fringe, which is a mini-festival by amateur artists, musicians, mimes, and acrobats. Deacon Brodie's Pub was named after City Councillor William Brodie, who was often here. 
the man who lived a double life gave Robert Louis Stevenson the main idea to write his world-famous novel, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Brody worked as an official by day, but at night, he robbed and pillaged. The irony of fate is that he was executed on the gallows that he had perfected. Shops delight tourists with several typically Scottish souvenirs, such as tartan clothes and textiles, as well as products made of good quality wool. An accessory of the folk costume is a sporon, which is a kind of ornate purse, and another is dirk, which is a short knife. Glass manufacturing is also famous. Ancient Celtic motifs are used to ornament glass, as well as metal objects. We can choose from several kinds of Scottish whiskey, but we can also buy Scottish beer, liqueur, and tea as souvenirs. Pipe smokers are pleased with the good tobacco from the Highlands, and shortbread, which is a kind of biscuit consumed with marmalade and tea, is also popular. Marmalade is a Scottish invention. The wife of a greengrocer was the first to make it when her husband was sold a large amount of unmarketable bitter oranges. Orange marmalade is sometimes flavored with whiskey, honey, or ginger. It's known that every clan's kilts, ties, and other garments are made with their own individual tartan. After the battle at Coladeni, it was forbidden to wear the ancient costume for nearly 100 years. Who did was sent to prison. Meanwhile, the patterns had largely been forgotten. Then a textile maker had the idea to make a new collection from which the leaders of the clans could choose and the chosen pattern would be reserved for them and named after them. Since then, there have been tartans bearing the name of MacDonald, Campbell, Kennedy, MacLeod, and Mackenzie. At Royal Mile, an exhibition in a huge hall shows how the plaid is made. It's a complete complex where we can learn everything about tartans and the costume made of it called kilts. The kilt was first born by necessity. In the Scottish Highlands, where the weather is rigorous, the costume of the people consists of a wool blanket, which is wrapped around their waist and across the shoulder and waterproof by sheep tallow. This costume is only worn at special occasions today, so it's become quite ornate. The members of the royal family also wear it when they visit Scotland. The huge square in front of the entrance of the castle in Edinburgh is the Esplanade. It used to be the site of executions and military parades. Fortunately, today only the latter takes place in August during the military tattoo. A wrought iron well is located on the site where witches used to be burnt. The ornate gate was built only 100 years ago in place of a featureless entrance in the castle wall. In front of it, there's an honor guard, changing every hour, and visitors like taking photos of this ceremony. The castle itself was built on the 135-meter high basalt cone of an inactive volcano. Like almost every castle, this also developed continuously. King Edwin, for whom the city was named, may have had the first fortress built in the 6th century. Robert Bruce had the previous buildings destroyed in 1313 so that they wouldn't belong to the English. Then, the rebuilt castle was a royal residence for centuries. On the side of the rocks exploited during construction, a system of dungeons was established. It was used as a storeroom and prison. During the time of Napoleon, many French soldiers were imprisoned here. Their inscriptions graved in the wall can be seen even today. The military prison was redecorated and its display is populated with wax figures. In the former building of the guards, the Museum of Royal Dragoons can be found. The oldest building of the castle is the small Margaret Chapel. The princess for whom the castle was named was Edward Atheling's daughter, and she was brought up with her sister and brother, Christine and Edgar, in the royal court of the Hungarian king, St. Stephen. Later, she got married to the Scottish king, Malcolm II. They had a lot of children, and four of their sons sat on the throne of Scotland. The castle has three rows of guns. A gunshot is shot at one o'clock from one of the guns of Mills Mount. Why is the gun shot at one o'clock and not at noon? Because then they should shoot 12 and well, we are in Scotland. Jacob IV had the palace in Crown Square built in 1430. 130 years later, Mary Stuart bore his son here. The most beautiful room of the castle may be the salon, 
which was built for royal ceremonies. It was also used for parliamental sessions. It's worth looking at its ceiling with beams, which have been nicely redecorated, and have a look at its plentiful collection of weapons. The crown jewels and the Stone of Destiny are also displayed in the palace. The Scottish royal crown with its quite rugged destiny is at least 400 years older than the English one. The mace was last used in 1707 when the two parliaments were united. Then the crown jewels were locked in a case and walled up. Sir Walter Scott was allowed to bring them to light and display them only 111 years later. The Stone of Destiny was the block of stone that the Scottish kings put their feet on during their coronation ceremony. The English took it to Westminster Abbey, where it was a part of the English throne for centuries. In 1950, it was stolen by young Scots, but they had to wait for 47 years until it was officially allowed to bring it back to Edinburgh. Many people think the original stone was ornamented with engravings and was hidden in 1296. Legend has it that Scotland will regain its independence when this original stone is found. The Scots have always loved legends. We can encounter the memory of Robert Burns, the best-known Scottish poet, at many places in the country. He was born in Alloway and died in Dumfries, but he spent the majority of his 37 years in Edinburgh. In August, the whole city is in the fever of the festival. There are six programs running parallel. It's impossible to avoid the actors of the Fringe, even if we wanted to. But why would we want to? St. Andrew, the patron saint of Scotland, was a follower of St. John the Baptist and a believer in Christ. He was crucified on an X-shaped cross, which has been called Andrew's Cross since then, and it's in the Scottish flag too. The first Greek bishop of Scotland brought his relics with him and placed them in a church of a city called St. Andrew, of course. The city has become a place of pilgrimage and the religious center of the country. Its cathedral was the biggest one in Scotland until the Reformation. Today, it's one of the religious buildings of the country which is still impressive, even in ruins. St. Andrew's University was the first in the country, and the city has a unique peculiarity as well. It's the cradle of golf. The British Golf Museum shows the over 500-year-old history of the game. The courses on the coast are some of the most elegant ones. It's the biggest wish of snobs to belong to the ancient royal club. On the wall of the building, which is modest from the outside but gorgeous inside, there's a painting of Mary Stuart with a golf club in her hands on the course of St. Andrews. As the painting was made in 1563, we can say that golf, as well as tennis, was first played much earlier than we would have thought. The Queen, who didn't detest the pleasures of life, was criticized by her contemporaries for joining the men to do sports despite being a queen and a woman. There are a lot of expensive shops offering golf gear and equipment in the streets of the city. It seems incredible how many kinds of golf clubs are needed for anyone who takes this sport seriously. The shops wait for their customers with a wide range of golf equipment, taking the changeable weather into consideration. Of course, local pubs are ornamented in the golf theme and show collections of old equipment. Crail is a picturesque fishing village, which is a resort and a place for artists as well. Nearby, we can visit a museum of fishing. May Island, which has been proclaimed a nature reserve, is a refuge for seals and aquatic birds. Alexander Selkirk, whom Defoe took as a model for the figure of Robinson, lived here. Dundee is an industrial city with a population of 200,000. Its fruit and fish processing industry, as well as textiles, are significant. Besides, it has a university and the center of the press in Scotland. In 1993, a decision was made to improve the tourism of the city. As many ships were built here in the 19th century, it seemed to be evident that tourists could be attracted here by ships. The battleship Unicorn, as well as the discovery after renovation, has been displayed here for this purpose. 
The ship lying at anchor at Craig Pier was built here in 1900, and returning from its expedition, it lay at anchor at the London Passage of the Thames for a long time. The ship took part in the first English expedition to the South Pole under Captain Robert F. Scott's captaincy, and had spent two winters in the Antarctic, frozen in the ice. Despite the winters spent frozen in the ice, the dignified ship still looks as if it were a new one. Captain Scott left for his second voyage from the English Cardiff in 1910. This time, he reached the Pole, although he got there five weeks after Amundsen. On the way back, he couldn't reach the food storehouses, which had been set up there earlier, and he and his staff died. Their bodies and diaries were found half a year later. Several films and books have dealt with their expedition. Walking on the deck of the ship, we can project ourselves into the story, aided by the exhibition of original articles for personal use and a lecture with slides. Glamis Castle is one of the best-known castles in Scotland. King Robert II bought it for his wife in 1372. The original castle consists of only one high, slim tower. This tower was built in the present building, and the labyrinth-like construction was made by serial expansions and reconstruction. The sixth Lord of Glamis was accused of high treason, and his wife of witchcraft. The lady was burned at the stake in front of the castle in Edinburgh. She's alleged to have haunted her own castle since then, which the king confiscated. Jacob ruled the country from here for five years, and he wasn't disturbed by spooks. Queen Mother, who died recently at the age of over 100, was born here in 1900 and later bore her daughter, Princess Margaret, the sister of the Queen, here. Shakespeare used the castle as one of the scenes in Macbeth. Tour guides are glad to show the hall where King Duncan was killed in the drama. It's supposed that the castle hides secret halls and corridors. Though the Irish and Scottish still argue about where whiskey was invented, Scottish whiskey is without a doubt more famous. The word comes from the Gaelic word meaning the water of life. It's not clear when and where and by whom the first drink was made. Written records first mention such a drink in the 1400s. Whiskey can be made from one kind of malt, which is called single malt, and from several kinds of malt called vatted malt. It's distinguished according to the place it was made, so it may come from the Highlands, Lowlands, Campbelltown, or Isley. The label blended refers to being mixed, that is the several kinds of whiskey are combined so that the drink can have a uniform taste and quality independently of its age. When storing, the producers are careful to store barrels of various ages within one storehouse. Thus, if a storehouse should burn down or any other catastrophe should happen, a whole age group wouldn't be destroyed. Some whiskey distilleries have been built and equipped to accommodate groups of tourists. They offer tourists not only whiskey samples, but also lunch and accommodation. It's possible to buy whiskey at a reduced rate. In fact, we can buy such a drink that we bottle and cork ourselves, and we may also add a label with our own name on it. The first step of making the drink is to germinate barley. The barley malt is dried, ground, and mashed, during which the starch is turned into sugar by enzymes. 
The quality of the water given during mashing is very important. The yellowish-brownish water of the streams on the Scottish Highlands has a high mineral content and is especially suitable for whiskey production. Local experts say the drink may be diluted only with this water when tasting it. Soda and ice are used only by Americans. The juice of malt is filled in fermenting vats where due to the starch content, sugar turns into alcohol. This liquid containing about 10% alcohol is distilled in special copper vats. The second distillate is colorless, brandy-like, and contains about 70% alcohol. This has to be mellowed in wooden barrels for at least three years, according to the standard, so that it can be given the name whiskey. The flavor and quality of the drink depends on the place of origin, production process, and the barrels. There are some that are aged in new oak barrels, which give a different flavor from the ones aged in used barrels, in which there's some left from the previous drink, which can be only whiskey, port, or sherry. From these, some kinds of whiskey take on the flavor, which is typical of them. The internationally best known brands are Chivas Regal, Ballantines, Johnny Walker, Glenlivet, and Black and White. The favorites of the locals are the specialties that rarely cross the border of the country. Such favorites are Edredur with mint flavor, Macallan and Lochmugger with sherry flavor, the peppery Talisker, and Lagavulin with its unforgettable smoky flavor of peat. In the beautiful valley of Great Glen Loch Ness, the most famous lake of Scotland can be found. It's extremely narrow compared to its 37 kilometer length. Its average width is only 2.5 kilometers. Among old legends, we can find one about the origin of the lake. I wonder if it's only a myth there's a monster in it. It was first written in 565 that St. Columba met a horrible monster, which he chased back to the lake. Centuries passed and many other people saw the creature, but it became a world sensation only in 1933 when the first photographs of it were made. Since then, besides amateur observers and people obsessed with it, serious scientists have gone on expeditions to find the monster of the lake. The radar and voice radar they used signaled a moving object several times, but they were never able to record it with a motion picture camera. According to locals, a similar creature lives in Loch Morar. Geologists think the lakes of the highlands are connected with caves and the creatures can run through them. Though many people consider the existence of Nessie to be the impact of Scottish whiskey drunk in large quantity, it's worth listening to the opinion of Gerald Durrell, the most famous zoologist. I don't want to suggest for a minute somebody should accept the fact of the existence of unidentified creatures without screening the evidences thoroughly, but I am an advocate of being open-minded within the realms of common sense. After all, we can find a lot of such peculiarities in our world that we accept today, though we used to doubt their existence. So many people claim that today a monster from the time before history cannot exist, though those people who doubt should travel to New Zealand where they can find Tuatara, which doesn't care about what scientists think. The ancient animal called Cryptocladus, the skeleton of which has been found so many times and has been displayed at the museums of natural history throughout the world, would match the descriptions given by witnesses. The picturesque remainders of Urquhart Castle are right on the shore of the lake. Most people observe the lake from the top of the castle. In Dromnagrochit, five kilometers from the ruins of the castle, there are two exhibitions displaying the suppositions and research in connection with the monster of the lake. Inverare is a picturesque town in the highlands which has preserved the atmosphere of the 18th century. Its 38 meter high belfry has the most beautiful carillon of the country. From its top we can see Loch Fyne and the nearby Naval Museum. As a Scottish legend says, if you don't like the weather, wait for five minutes, it'll change. And indeed, while somebody goes down the stairs of the hotel or drives the car out of the garage, the weather may change totally. The wind starts blowing, then it stops. It starts raining, then it stops. Without layered clothing, a cap or shawl, and of course an umbrella, we'd better not leave. The months from spring to autumn are suitable for day trips and visiting castles. 
The average temperature isn't higher than 18 degrees even in summer, but this doesn't mean there are no warm days. But the climate of the highlands is fairly rough all year round. Inveraray is the seat of the Campbells, the largest clan of Scotland. The present castle was built on the foundation of the castle, built in 1457, designed by Roger Morris, a follower of Palladianism. In 1770, the whole medieval village was demolished to make way for the parks around the castle, and the village was rebuilt further away. The corner towers of the classical palace, with a symmetric ground plan, were covered up with small towers after the fire in the 20th century, and the attic was also formed at that time. Near the castles, the typical highland woolly cattle graze, looking as if they were protecting themselves from inclement weather with a great coat. Some of them have a very nice hairdo, too. The castle contains unique art treasures. The Presbyterian Campbell family stored loads of old weapons so that they could contend with the Jacobite rebels. Rob Roy's dagger also belongs to the collection. The frescoes were painted by the French painters Girard and Grunard, and among the paintings, there are also some by Gainsborough and Ramsey. A part of the furniture is genuine Regency furniture. One of the main attractions of Inveraray is the prison from the Georgian era, which has been turned into a wax museum. In the vicinity of the city is Scotland's oldest open-air museum. Loch Lamond, which is a favorite of day-trippers, is the biggest lake of Scotland. The lake and its surroundings has been proclaimed a nature reserve. On its east shore are Queen Elizabeth Park and the famous hiking route, the West Highland Way. The lake is flanked with mountain ranges with about 1,000 meter high peaks, Ben Eim and Ben Lamond. We can get the most beautiful view of the countryside from the top of Duncrine Mountain. In the villages of the neighborhood, in Luss and Tarbet, Motorboats and jet skis can be rented. The water of the lake is rather cold, but this doesn't disturb the locals. Sailing, traveling by motorboat, diving and fishing are equally popular here. The lake gives the opportunity to do any of these activities, of course mainly in the summer months. Many people visit this place from Glasgow, which is only 35 kilometers from here. Many urban people have bought a weekend house next to Loch Lamont. In fact, there are people who've moved here for good and commute from here to the city to work. Callender is the gate of the Trosachs mountain range. Walter Scott's narrative poem, The Lady of the Lake, takes place at Loch Katrine. Cruise steamers named after the writer run in the lake. In one of the old church buildings of the city, there's a Rob Roy memorial with an exhibition, film, and souvenir shop. All the sites in the neighborhood are connected to Rob Roy's name. We'll be here long after we've gone. The story was also written by Defoe and Walter Scott and countless films have been made, the last one starring Liam Neeson. Rob Roy was born in the village of Glengyle in 1671. Like Robin Hood, he stole from the rich to provide food for the poor. The Duke of Montrose imprisoned him and burnt down his house, for which Rob Roy took revenge. Towards the end of his life, he was pardoned and he settled down in Bakhidur. 
He was buried here in 1734. His grave, as well as the house he was born in, is a place of pilgrimage. The ancient royal town of Stirling lies on an important site from a strategic point of view. It's next to the mouth of the Forth in a narrow passage which joins the north and south part of the country. Anyone who dominates Stirling dominates Scotland, used to be said. The town owes its rough history to this. Nearby, Robert Bruce's army beat the English in the Battle of Bannockburn. William Wallace deserved the acknowledgement of posterity for the victory over the English. Some years ago, a new statue was dedicated at the bottom of the stairs leading to the monument and the Rock of Abbey Craig. The face of the statue takes after Mel Gibson, which is no coincidence, since the star played the role of Wallace in the film Brave Heart. The screenplay was written by a descendant of Wallace. Anyone who's seen the film, which won several Oscars, knows that King Bruce knighted Wallace, who piled victory upon victory. But in the battle at Falkirk, the Scottish nobles left the rebels of public order to themselves. Wallace fell into the hands of the English due to betrayal. He was cut into four, and his body was put on the tower of four castles to deter the Scottish. The Highlands Festival is held in Stirling every year and attracts a lot of people. In the city, it's worth having a look at the house of the Earl of Mar, despite its ruinous state. Argyle's lodging is said to be the most beautiful building in Scotland, dating back to the 17th century. Mary Stuart's second husband lived in Darnley House. In Holyrood Church, King Jacob VI was crowned. Market Cross, with a unicorn atop, is on the site of the former marketplace. Don't miss Stirling Bridge, where the famous battle took place. Stirling Castle is located on a 75-meter high hill of volcanic origin. In the old royal buildings, the War History Museum has been established. We can also look at the Palace of Jacob V and the Parliament Hall, as well as the Royal Chapel. In the square in front of the entrance of the castle, a statue of King Bruce places his sword into its scabbard after the battle in Bannockburn. Glasgow means green area in Celtic. After a long time, today we can find green areas and parks again in Scotland's largest city, which was only famous for its industry for a long time. Its bishopric was set up in the 12th century, its university in the 15th century, but it hardly has any monuments from the medieval period. Moreover, its history before that time remains obscure. After the flourishing of the Middle Ages, the centuries passed monotonously. Glasgow owed its boom to the Industrial Revolution and the establishment of the British Empire. The ships carrying sugar, rum, and tobacco from the colonies arrived at its harbor. Coal mining, iron manufacturing, and heavy industry predestined the city to become the biggest workshop for shipbuilding in the British Empire. At the same time, the merchants who became rich invested their money in the new industries, investing in anything where they smelled profit. So besides heavy industry, also light industry, especially textile manufacturing, also started to boom. With industrialization, old streets, even whole parts of the city, were demolished and reconstructed. The population of the city multiplied. Immigrants arrived after hearing about the opportunities to work. Many people came here, especially from the poor areas of Ireland. Modest housing estates were built for the workers covering a big area. There were new palaces and huge Victorian buildings built in the city, but social contrast became bigger and bigger, with luxury and poverty at the same time. During the Second World War, Glasgow was the center of manufacturing ammunition. Then it began to gradually decay until by the 1970s, it was totally devastated. The new management of the city has done everything to improve it since 1990, trying to exchange industry for tourism. The city has won the title of the Cultural Capital of Europe and the title of the Architectural City of the United Kingdom. Exhibitions, festivals, concerts and cultural events attract visitors. 
Glasgow is only 70 kilometers from Edinburgh, so foreign tourists staying there will come for a trip here. The most beautiful square of the city is George's Square, which is actually the center of the city. The streets leading from here to the main railway station have the most attractions. In front of the office of the Celtic Football Club, there's always a long queue. It's worth looking at the buildings of the old and new town hall, the Merchant House, and St. Mungo Cathedral. Ayr is a beautiful seaside town with a population of 50,000 at the mouth of a river with the same name. Here we can find everything that we would expect of a real Scottish town. In other words, a statue of Burns and a monument of Wallace. The latter is on the side of the tower where the strategist was imprisoned and from which he escaped. Ayr is well known for the fact that Wallace initiated the War of Independence against the English here. In the old pub where Tam O'Shander, one of Burns' heroes, staggered out, a museum has been established. The biggest horse race track of the country can also be found here. The races for the Scottish Grand Prize are held every spring. But Peggy dear, the evening's clear. Thick flies the skimming swallow. The sky's blue, the fields in view, all fading green and yellow. Come, let us stray our gladsome way and view the charms of nature, the rustling corn, the fruited thorn, and every happy creature. Burns was keen on the country, which charmed others as well. It's not by accident that so many films that needed picturesque landscape have been shot here. Think of Highlander or Harry Potter. The ruinous castle of Dunor used to be the ancestral seat of the Kennedy clan. In 1792, Calzine Castle became the residence of the family. Dunor can be visited without an admission fee. Many people come here to have a picnic, enjoying the beautiful view from the tower of the castle over the waves washing the rocks. Nearby, a sheltered harbor accepts the small motorboats of travelers. Burns' birthplace is only four kilometers from Alloway. The Kennedy family had the most talented architect, Robert Adam, design their castle. He controlled the building operations, and for the sake of the entire harmony, he also took the design of the interior decoration and tapestry in his own hands. The Neo-Gothic castle was built on a high rock which slopes towards the sea. When the 9th Earl of Cassilis, Sir Thomas, inherited the huge lordship, only an old fortress with only one round tower stood there. On that foundation, this castle, which is thought to be Adam's most significant work, was built. When David Kennedy died without an heir in 1792, the estate was inherited by his cousin from New York, Archibald. Colzine Castle was in the possession of the American side of the family until the middle of the 20th century. In 1945, it was donated to Scotland with the condition that the upstairs suite be in possession of General Eisenhower in acknowledgement of his feats. Eisenhower became the President of America only later. When he was granted the castle, he was the Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Forces. His suite is a memorial museum today. Besides this suite, a huge collection of weapons and the oval staircase attract visitors. A book about Scottish castles writes the following. 
In the huge park of the castle, forests alternate with rhododendron alleys and Italian gardens looking onto the sea. An artificial footpath links the fountain with the garden surrounded by a wall in which the typical art of English gardening is in perfect harmony with the combination of flowers of various colors and sizes. The huge estate has been proclaimed a nature reserve. In the walled gardens, visitors are welcomed. A professional guide is even available. The pond has been populated with swans, and inside a huge fenced-off space, roe and deer graze. The famous Camellia's house is only one of the buildings with an eye to botany. In the glass houses, many curiosities are grown. The beautiful main building of the park, which is in harmony with the castle, was built by Robert Adam. It was open to the public in 1970. New Lanark, which was the most important cotton processor in the country at the end of the 18th century, is located next to three waterfalls of the Clyde River Valley. There was manufacturing here until 1960, then the factory was reconstructed into a museum. David Dale and his son-in-law, Robert Owen, established their factory in 1785, using the energy of the water, but not exploiting their workers. Their enterprise is an example of making profit while still respecting the employees. They spent the majority of their profit on making their standard of living better. They built a housing estate, nursery school, school, library, chapel, and surgery for their workers. We can look at all of these at the authentically restored weaving workshops. Annie McLeod experience shows us the world of the 1800s by showing the life of a working girl. In the shops of New Lanark, we can buy wool products made here. A few kilometers from here, in Blantyre, the African researcher David Livingston was born. We can find his birthplace more easily than Stanley did the missionary. Christina Gamboa writes, Bright green fields with flocks of sheep grazing, mountainsides covered with purple heather and deep blue lakes which reflect the lead-gray sky. In this country, which is beautiful even in its wildness, the Scottish castles remind us of the history of the country. They emerge from the mist of the legends like pickets jagged with towers that help the wanderer on his way. When we catch sight of any Scottish castle, we feel we found the most beautiful. This is also the case with Drumlanry Castle, which was built for the Douglas clan on the site of a previous fortress of theirs. Sir William Douglas ordered to build the pink sandstone castle with four towers at the end of the 1600s. He paid a huge amount of money for it, for which he suffered for the rest of his life. The stories about the Scottish being mean may have originated here. The exterior appearance of the monumental castle is a bit bleak, but the inner courtyard, the spacious halls, and the beautiful parks have a renaissance zest for life. In Drumlanrig Castle, the rooms walled in oak wood safeguard inestimable treasures, such as paintings by Leonardo, Rembrandt, Murillo, and Holbein. But the relics of Charles Pretty Boy are equally valuable. King Bruce's heart locked in a box is only a copy. Sir James Douglas carried this in the battlefields, complying with the former king's request. The original was placed in the abbey in Melrose. In the dining room, the portraits of the Douglas family are hung. All of them are works of great masters. The embroidery above the fireplace is a piece of amateur work, made by Mary Stewart. Dumfries means a castle surrounded by broom. The settlement situated on the bank of the river is also called the Queen of the South. 
Its picturesque streets and houses wouldn't attract so many tourists, but the places commemorating Burns attract thousands of the poet's fans and followers. The greatest figure of Scottish poetry spent the last five years of his life here, and is also buried here. Burns was born into a poor farmer family in 1759. Despite his ancestry, he educated himself with great ambition, learning to speak Latin and French. After the moral and financial success of his first volume of poems, his problems seemed to be solved. He became the celebrated poet of the Salons of Edinburgh. He took part in collecting and publishing folk songs of the Highland while he was writing his lyric works full of fine humor. His style brilliantly mixed the contemporary English language with the Scottish dialect. His realistic genre pictures prove his luscious folk humor, while his satires prove his hatred of hypocritical religious fanatics. Some of his amorous poems showing his zest for life have been put to music. When his career reached its culmination, he bought an estate near Dumfries. He tried new techniques of agriculture and animal breeding, but he soon went bankrupt and his financial problems accompanied him for the rest of his life. He died at the age of 37. In his house, his manuscripts and personal belongings are on display. There's a memorial plaque on the wall of his favorite haunts, the Globe Inn, and horses and coaches, and in the main street, a statue's been erected in his memory. The theme of the new exhibition in the former building of the mill is the relationship between the poet and the town. His fans had a mausoleum built in the garden of St. Michael's Church over his grave with public contributions. Moffat is a small settlement famous for its wool manufacturing, which a bronze sheep statue also shows. The small town is a jumping off place for trips in the neighboring areas. The famous Gretna Green is only 40 kilometers from here. While in England, advance announcement and parents' consent were needed for marriage, according to Scottish law, two witnesses were enough to get married. And why did the Smith marry the couples in his workshop? Because according to Celtic traditions, the young couple was welded together this way. Grey Mare's Tail Waterfall is only 17 kilometers from Moffat. The road leads among flocks of sheep grazing on gentle green hills. Bleak forests, mountains with heath. The green water of the foyers is from there. It's full of foam and flowing up the hill. Its current is broken on misshapen stones. Its ringing water shins up the air and down into the depth. White sheet flowing on the rock. Echo answers its sound. Billowing fog, shower not stopping. Veil of eyes and ears on the cave. Selkirk is a small town at the meeting point of the Yarrow and Ettrick rivers. Its inhabitants deal mainly with wool processing. Tourists might come here as transient passengers if Sir Walter Scott hadn't been a judge here. As we know, the writer was also an important person in the public life of Scotland. He was the judge of Selkirkshire for 35 years, and he must have been a very hard-working man if he was still able to ride his huge oeuvre. In the square, we can see a white marble statue of Scott. His former courtroom, which stands near the marketplace in Selkirk, is a memorial room today with manuscripts, personal belongings, and the writer's death mask. Jedburgh used to be a royal seat, and today it's still borders, that is, the most important settlement of the frontier. Its significant monument is the Fortress Prison, which is a remainder of the former royal castle.
Mary, Queen of Scots, was famous for her cheerfulness and for her romantic adventures. She might have had a role in assassinating one of her husbands, the jealous and brutal Lord Darnley. The prime suspect in the assassination was the Queen's lover, Earl Bothwell. The Earl was injured in Hermitage Castle during one of the bloody brushes at the frontier. Mary, who was supervising the judicial hearings, mounted her horse to visit her lover immediately. But her horse was frightened of something and bucked the Queen off, who lay unconscious for a few days. She was looked after in Jedburgh for weeks in the house which has been called Mary Queen of Scots House since then. The building, dating back to 1546, has become a museum, and in 1987, at the 400th anniversary of Mary's execution, a collection showing her life was established here. Her death mask can also be seen here. While the castles of Scotland have remained for the most part intact, almost each abbey is in ruins. The Abbey of Jedburgh has no roof. King David I, who had the Margaret Chapel in Edinburgh built, ordered to build it in 1138. The church was built for the monks of the Augustine Order from red sandstone on the foundation of a Celtic building dating back to the 9th century. The lavishly carved Norman doorway and rose windows of the building of Romanesque and early Gothic style are admired by many people. The abbey used to be the location of coronations, royal weddings, christenings, and where important people lay in state, but it saw its share of fights and destruction as well. It had to be restored eight times. The castle in Jedburgh was destroyed in 1409, only its gate remained. Kelso, lying at the meeting point of the Tweed and Tevio rivers, is one of the most beautiful settlements of the borders. Its cobblestone streets and squares are flanked by houses from the age of Victoria and George. Except for the horse races in Ayr, the horse races in Kelso are the best known in the country. The Abbey of Kelso was the oldest, biggest, and richest in all of Scotland. Its foundation is connected to David I, 10 years before Jedburgh. It took 84 years to build it, but it was destroyed much faster by English troops. In 1545, even the monks were slaughtered. It could never regain its pomp, and today it's in the worst condition among the abbeys of the borders. The Tweed River is a favorite place for salmon and trout fishing. Many people come here from abroad to enjoy this hobby. About Flores Castle, even Walter Scott said, it seems rather the fairy palace of Oberon and Titania in A Midsummer Night's Dream by Shakespeare than a house of an earthly person. The main supporter of the Anglo-Scottish Union, the Earl of Roxburgh, commissioned William Adam, the greatest architect of the era, to reconstruct and expand the former fortress. Nothing can be seen from the great architect's work today. In 1849, William Playfair almost totally reconstructed the building. Its small domes, towers, and helmets were added at that time. The castle itself lies on a natural ground terrace at the bottom of the mountain, while the estate belonging to it is located in the valley of the River Tweed. Thanks to Roxburgh's grandson's marriage into a rich family, the castle is so full of art treasures that the inventory book is likely to be thicker than the telephone directory in Edinburgh especially the collection of tapestries is famous. The Abbey in Dryburgh, 
is said to be the monastery richest in historic relics. It's in the Valley of the Tweed in wonderful natural surroundings. It's worth going for a walk from the monastery towards the north along the river to the old stone bridge. As one of the four abbeys of the borders, the abbey in Dryborough also became the victim of fights several times. From 1296 through three centuries, Scotland waged a war of independence against England. The alliance with France and the clans at the borders becoming independent made the situation more complicated. So the Scottish kings made war on oligarchs of the borders if they had a little time during their fight against the English. The abbey in Dryborough was set on fire twice, so not much has remained, but its ruins are so romantic that Walter Scott asked in his last will to be buried here. Abbotsford House is the most interesting Scottish castle because the man who had it built was he who probably knew and loved the history, traditions, landscapes, and castles of the country more than anybody else. Sir Walter Scott spent his whole childhood in the neighborhood, on his grandfather's estate, in Sandy No, and he lost his heart for the valley of the Tweed River. As a result of a disease in his childhood, he limped, so instead of doing sports and playing games, he spent his time reading. He became fascinated by Scottish tales and ballads. He collected ballads, and later he wrote some. After Byron had appeared, he looked for and found a new genre, the historic novel. His novels, Kenilworth, Red Gauntlet, Rob Roy, and Ivanhoe, which has been screened several times, are popular worldwide. As the judge of the region, he made a good fortune. He bought Cartley Hole Estate in 1799 and renamed it to be Abbotsford because the estate used to belong to Melrose Abbey. Thirteen years later, he'd saved up enough to begin construction. He asked William Atkinson, the designer, to build the castle in the Scottish Romance style, taking the Baron castles built in the previous centuries as models. That's why we can find the copy of the ornate gate of the nearby abbey, while the ceiling of the library is the exact copy of the chapel in Rosslyn. He collected historic objects with a passion. His desk was made of one of the pieces of furniture from one of the ships of the Spanish Armada. Several of the pieces of his arm collection were collected at the Battle of Waterloo. He had a stroke in 1830, but he was still able to finish two novels. He left for a village on the Mediterranean Sea to improve his health, but this was futile. On the 21st of September, 1832, he asked his family to take his bed to the dining room from where he could see the river. During his funeral, the hearse stopped at the lookout tower, which has been named after him since then, as the writer in his life had done so many times. Melrose is an evocative town which is famous for its abbey. It's one of the four famous abbeys of the borders, from which only ruins have remained. It was built for Cistercians of Yorkshire in 1136 on the site of a monastery of the 7th century. In 1322 and 1385, it was rebuilt, but the destruction in 1545 determined its fate. The notorious monarch, Henry VIII, wanted to force the three-year-old Queen Mary to marry his son, Edward. This is called drastic courtship by history. The buildings, mainly the monasteries of the borders, regretted this unfavorable welcome. This was the king's way of getting revenge on Scotland. Only some buildings and some walls have remained from the monastery, but despite this, several couples had their wedding on its green lawn. 
There are no such occasions without Scottish folk costume and bagpipe music. <laughs> 